So does this thing work? Are you hearing me out there? I take that as a yes. I want to ask you first, how many of you have been to Pyongyang, capital of North Korea? <laughs> Hands, please. I'm very disappointed in you. Well, when you go to Pyongyang, and someday you will, I imagine, you will be taken to the tower of the Juche Idea. That is a huge tower. It looks roughly like the Washington Monument. It's actually a little bigger than the Washington Monument. And it is a monument to North Korea's soft power. In other words, its version of its philosophy, which it tries to export to the world. Juche is roughly translated into self-reliance. And it is a, uh, a philosophy that basically has replaced communism in North Korea over the last two to three decades. At the base of this monument, this huge monument in Pyongyang, there are plaques. And the plaques have been contributed by Juche societies all over the world. In Ghana, Canada, and the United States. Perhaps surprised to know that there is a Juche society in the United States. How many of you have visited the Juche society here in the United States? Not too many people. When the North Korean delegations first started coming to the United States, one of their priorities was to visit the Juche Society in the United States, the one that, of course, contributed this plaque to the monument in Pyongyang. They wanted to see how successful their soft power was here in the United States. And a friend of mine who brought the delegation to New York to the Juche Society reported to me that they were a little disappointed they were a little disappointed when they found that the Juche Society occupied a dusty little room in the back of a floor of an unknown building with one part-time volunteer staff. And that was the last time that they asked to visit the Juche Society. I bring up the Juche Society of the United States and Juche in general for a couple of reasons. One, to of course, remind people that soft power is not just something the United States and Western Europe come up with as a way of influencing the policies of other countries. But I also bring it up as a reminder hmm, that we can be delusional sometimes about the impact that our soft power strategies can have. And you think, well, of course, North Korea. How could they possibly think that their philosophy would have any impact around the world, but particularly here in the United States? How could they be so delusional? And yet, if you look, for instance, at U.S. attempts sometimes in the Muslim world and how U.S. favorability ratings in the Muslim world have taken a nosedive, even, even, with the Obama administration's attempt to engage the Muslim world, we might have to remind ourselves that delusional fantasies are not just the monopoly of North Korea. But my topic, of course, is not the Middle East. My topic is Northeast Asia and the Cold War that is still present. Of course, it's over in Eastern Europe and Europe and more or less in US-Russian relations, but it's still raging in Northeast Asia. And soft power is a very important topic there because for the most part, as in Cold Wars elsewhere in the world, the military option on the Korean Peninsula is not on the table. The Pentagon, that has a couple of operational plans for contingencies that might take place on the Korean Peninsula, but the Pentagon doesn't want to go to war with North Korea. It knows that within a few days of a conflict breaking out, there will be hundreds of thousands of casualties, including tens of thousands of U.S. soldiers. It doesn't want to go to battle. So what does that leave the United States as an option for influencing North Korea's behavior if the military option's off the table? Well, there's isolating the country, a containment plus approach. Sanctions, not talking with them. Hmm might be a good strategy, except one problem, they have nuclear weapons. Not such a good idea to simply ignore them, isolate them, contain them, they keep testing these weapons. Okay, so what's the other option? Engagement. Engagement of some kind, an engagement that includes some form of soft power. 
And what does soft power mean in terms of U.S. strategy toward Northeast Asia? There are basically three components, the 3M strategy. There is the media, Voice of America, Radio Free Asia, beaming in information to North Korea about what's going on in the world. You probably, to the extent that you know a lot about North Korea, you know that it's an isolated country. Folks there don't have a lot of access to information. Frankly, they don't have a lot of radios that can tune in to Radio Free Asia, Voice of America, but let's put that to the side for the moment. This is the strategy that the U.S. pursues, as well as funding a lot of Korean language stations based in South Korea. Second strategy, missionaries. Lots of missionaries who are along the border with China distributing Bibles. They hope that will go into North Korea. The Bible itself, a little challenging to bring it in there because if you're found with the Bible, sometimes you're executed. So they send in like flash drives. It's a little safer. Also, they set up institutions inside North Korea itself. You might be surprised to learn that the Unification Church, Sun Myung Moon, has a fiat factory. It actually produces cars in Nampo in North Korea. The Pyongyang University of Science and Technology set up by Korean American missionaries. Okay, they're not distributing Bibles, they're teaching computers and English, but presumably they like to have conversations quietly with folks in which they spread the word. Third strategy, market. We try to influence North Korea by giving them trainings on market uh, technologies, market theories. For the most part, not the United States. We don't have really much of a relationship with, the, with North Korea at the moment. So it's mostly German foundations and Europeans who are doing these market trainings. There's a fourth strategy also an M, music, talk about cultural diplomacy. Probably remember when the Philharmonic went to North Korea and played in Pyongyang. That's a fourth kind of strategy. All these strategies are intended to change North Korean behavior. And the expectation is that, like Eastern Europe, North Korea will change, that there'll be a kind of velvet revolution as a result of this soft power uh, campaign, shall we call it. The problem is that North Korea knows very well what this strategy is. In fact, it uses various metaphors to describe U.S. and European soft power strategies. There's the poison apple metaphor. North Korea, as you know, was in a famine in the 1990s, and so we offered them food, but they knew that with food, with humanitarian aid, came ideology a poisoned apple. If they take the apple, they need it, they're hungry, but there's something else in there with the apple. Another metaphor they use is the window. They say, well, we know we should raise the window to let some ideas in, to let some new technologies in, but when you open the window, flies come in as well, they say. They don't like it when flies come in. Flies being, of course, all of the nasty aspects of capitalism, uh, prostitution, all the things they worry about. And so they want to put in a screen as much as possible to keep out the flies.